let me uh, first say how much of an honor it is for me to be here on the, on the panel uh, with uh, Congresswoman Sewell and, and uh, MP from the UK, Diane Abbott. It's a pleasure in part because I, I, I used to do some work in the UK uh, on racial issues. And I never met Diane, but she, her presence was bigger than life. And an uh, old friend of mine who's now passed, Bernie Grant, uh, he, would, he would really talk a lot of, of, of uh, he would make very strong statements towards everyone but Diane Abbott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we're happy that she's here uh, from uh, New York uh, because of Beijing plus uh, 15, I think. And, and Congresswoman Sewell, uh, as you may have seen on television, was just in Selma, Alabama. Uh, I uh, uh, happen to have been there also, uh, and I was lucky to be there uh, because uh, we sometimes uh, hear about people who, who read history or write history, but she helped make some. So today, uh, my role is an easy one. Um, uh, somewhere I read, I was supposed to say something about my background, but I think given that it's Women's History Month and International Women's Day fell on Bloody Sunday, uh, we should uh, get to it right away. But I do think, uh, as a man, it's important for me to say that this uh, so-called uh, gender myopia, the denying that, uh, of existence of barriers, is something that is quite pervasive. And it's something that we as men have to uh, uh, address uh, in support of women who are struggling for their rights, et cetera. Uh, it, it is impossible for anyone uh, like myself or others who've been in the civil rights movement in this country or the human rights movement more broadly, to talk about um, uh, the progress of those movements and their relationships to other uh, social movements without focusing on the role of women. Um, the movement that Dr. King uh, began, uh, uh, the dinners that were sold were sold by women. And the organizing was done by women. But the names that we may or may not know, like Rosa Parks, or Ella Baker, or Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, or, or Coretta Scott King, or September Clark, and others from those movements uh, that Terry Sewell now uh, is standing on their shoulders. Uh, but there are people here who were kicked out of the United States that went back to the UK. Um, and began to do organizing there at the time of immigration that uh, Diane Abbott uh, works on. So I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and all the men who will be uh, uh, in this room today, uh, you don't have to do anything but say Beijing and I slap myself. <laughs> <laughs> we have messed up the world in a big way. Uh, and we hope that women, uh, in particular women who have suffered from race, class, and gender discrimination, that triple oppression, will have something to say. Uh, now, Diane told me um, I can ask anything I want to ask, but she reminded me that she's a politician, so she's only going to answer what she wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought I would just uh, give each of them a few minutes to make some remarks uh, in their own way, uh, and then uh, to come to the audience, uh, because I know that you all are here to uh, participate. And, I'll just span the room. There's some uh, very important people in this room, political organizers who we won't mention who just came back from Zambia and Sierra Leone and other places and voting rights specialists uh, here. So I'm sure you're going to get a lot of good questions. So let me uh, first ask uh, Congresswoman uh, uh, Terry Sewell, uh, who is uh, her hometown is Selma, Alabama. And she's uh, uh, coming to us today out of Birmingham congressional district there. So let me turn it over to her now. Well, I actually really want to defer to my mentor so that she could go first. Um, seriously, Diane, I think that you um, should probably go first. Well, the first thing to say is how excited I am to be here with my friend Terry. And we've literally crossed the United States to be here for this event. Um, uh, we've known each other a long time, but as she said, we were children when we yes, first met. Absolutely. Yeah, children, children. <laughs> um, but I was so moved, and you must all have been moved, to see her speak at Selma, introducing John Lewis. 
And knowing her as long as I've known, known her, and also knowing that Selma is her hometown, and without that movement, Terry, for all her brilliance and accomplishment, would never be a US congressperson today. I thought that was exceptionally moving. I just want to say a few things by way of introduction. The first thing to say is perhaps about myself. My family come from Jamaica in the Caribbean. Um, my, they migrated to the UK in the late 50s. My father worked in a factory. My mother was a nurse. They had been brought up in rural Jamaica. And they both left school at 14. And I think had you said to them, as a young married couple, that their daughter would grow up to be Britain's first black female member of parliament, they wouldn't have believed it, because it's way outside their expectation. These were people, after all, who were brought up in a colony. Um, so I have always been mindful in my politics about where I come from, you know, where I come from politically and socially and culturally, because it seems to me that you have to know your own history to be able to move forward. And I've always felt that I owe a lot to the people that came before me. Um, I say my parents migrated in the late 50s. And migrating to the UK in the 50s was not a simple matter. It's not a simple matter. They came, they, they thought they were coming to the motherland, the promised land even. Actually, what they met was grim racism. It was a country where it was legal to discriminate. You could advertise rooms, and you could say you didn't want any blacks. You know, it was a, con a country where it was legal to discriminate, and professional people came from the Caribbean and found themselves doing menial jobs because they weren't allowed to teach and so on. So, you know, I'm always conscious that in having been able to go to university and become a member of parliament, I stand on the shoulders of others who campaign and fought and struggled. Um, I, uh, I suppose that the kind of key thing which set me on the road was um, I, I studied history at Cambridge University. Some of you will have heard of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing to say was when I went there, there were hardly any black students. In fact, in my college, there was no other student of African descent. And I remember studying history, and I would see, I, I was once, I saw a black man, I think, in my last year, in the history <laughs> faculty. And I went up to him and questioned him. And it turned out he was a graduate student. But that, yeah, but that was, that was the isolation, the balance of forces in a university like Cambridge. But you know what? It gave me the confidence to go forward in life. It also gave me a sense and this was a few years ago now, and I think students perhaps see it differently, but gave me a sense of having been privileged to have a really great education, that I had a responsibility to give back. So my passion about my roots and my origin, my passion to give back, um, those are the things that characterize my politics. And those are things that have kept me going, because as, as may come out in the question, politics is a tough neighborhood, particularly tough for women. And unless you believe in something, and unless you are rooted in something, and unless you care about your community, you, you, ca you cannot sustain it. Um, look, finally, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I was um, elected to the British Parliament in 1987, which was the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. And I remember I went back to Jamaica. I was actually born in London, but a lot of my family Jamaica. So I went back to Jamaica um, at Christmas. And I remember I went back to the little village where my parents were born and brought up. And it's a little tiny village. And if, it's, if you drive through it fast, you've missed it, because that's how small it is. It's a little village with kind of farmland outside. So I went back to the village Christmas Sunday, and I went to church Christmas Sunday. I went with my uncle Charles and my uncle Frederick Russell. So we're in the church now, and the, we have the service. And then the church elder, a woman called Sister Kate, who had actually taught my mother at Sunday school, Sister Kate came and did the announcements. And she announced the, the ladies' Bible reading circle, 
She announced the boys' club. She announced the choir practice. And then she said, and I'm delighted to see that we have her in the congregation with us this morning, little Lucy's daughter. <laughs> because in those small rural communities, wherever they are, you know, what matters is not that you've got your suit and your thing. What matters is your daughter and granddaughter you are. So I came out of the church and I stood on the steps. This is Smithley, remember? A tiny, dusty town in the middle of Jamaica, which none of you will have been to because it's not kind of tourist area at all, but it's a very pretty rural town. So I stand on the steps of the church. This woman rushed up to me. It's in the middle of Smithley, a tiny village. And she says, when I hear that a black woman become a MP in England, I was so pleased. But when I hear that a black woman become a MP in England, I know it was someone from Smithville. <laughs> so I come from a people, proud. I come from a proud people who taught me above all that if you only will it, if you only try, if you only endure, you can achieve your dreams. Awesome. Thank you. You want me to go after that? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say how honored I am to be on the same stage, the same platform with Diane Abbott. I, um, I met Diane on uh, six months before her election in 1986. I had uh, just graduated from college and won a scholarship to study at Oxford. And I remember reading in The Guardian as I was taking the train uh, from London to Oxford, um, at, that, that, that all of England was abuzzed, that 1987 general election would elect the first Afro-Caribbean uh, members of parliament. And they said that there were four that were likely to be elected. Only one woman, <laughs> three men. And I remember thinking to myself, what a great thing to write a thesis about, a master's thesis about. Why was it that England which abolished slavery, like you said, 150 years prior to that 1987 election, um, and, and had never really formally on the books you know, uh, made segregation the law of the land, although they discriminated. I really wanted, as intellectually, to sort of see why it was that 1987 was the first time blacks in Britain were able to get enough political power to actually elect people who look like themselves. And so I decided to write a letter, because after all, I'm from Selma, Alabama. <laughs> so I wrote a letter to Diane, to Paul Boateng, Bernie Grant, and Keith Vaz. And I wrote a, a letter saying, I just want to volunteer on your campaigns. Um, and I'm a student at Oxford. I could come down on Fridays and go knocking up, which I thought was really interesting, because I didn't know what <laughs> knocking up meant. I was like, OK, you mean I'm knocking up? <laughs> but to campaign with you all. And the first person who answered and replied was Diane. I don't know if you remember that. Um, Jenny replied on your behalf, and Jenny was uh, her press secretary at the time. And I mean, I'm, here I am, a graduate student from America, and you welcomed me not only into your campaign, but into your home. And do know that I am, was forever changed by my experience working with you both as a um, campaign intern and then when you were elected, to be in England on that night was just amazing. And it is something that has always stayed with me. Um, so your election, and then prior to meeting you, Diane, I don't know if you know this, but my thesis at Princeton, I wrote on black women in politics. I called it Black Women in Politics. Our time has come. And that was in 1986. <laughs> and I interviewed as a part of my thesis, Shirley Chisholm who was the very first African-American woman to walk the halls of Congress. And I don't know if you believe in divine intervention, but all my life there have been, there have been you know, periods in my life and episodes in my life that I know it's just the hand of something more divine than I at work. Um, so I wrote a, a, a letter to um, Shirley Chisholm. She had, at the time, she was teaching at Mount Holyoke College. I told her I was writing my thesis from, high, from college and would love to, to interview her. Her secretary said, you have 30 minutes, 30 minutes. So I took the train from Princeton to Massachusetts. And literally, just as I was walking into her office, it began to snow. 
And it snowed and it snowed. And my 30 minutes was four hours with Shirley Chisholm. Um, and so then on the heels of that, to come and meet you, Diane, and to experience your being elected as the first um, black woman um, to ever be in the House of Commons, it was just surreal. Um, and for me, I came away with from law school, college, graduate school with a lot of debt. Oxford was free. That was the only thing that was free. <laughs> uh, Princeton was not. Harvard Law School was not. And so, you know, life sends you, takes you on a journey. And so I, if you had asked the 18-year-old Terry Sewell, and perhaps even the 20-year-old that you met, Terry Sewell, what she wanted to do with her life, she probably would have said, I want to be a member of Congress. But life brings you so many different challenges that by the time I actually ran for Congress, I had never been elected to anything. I had, had just moved back home maybe four years prior to running. My dad had a series of strokes that left him in a wheelchair. It was a defining moment in my life. I started my legal practice both in New York and in London for a huge law firm. I was a securities lawyer on Wall Street. Go figure. Um, and But at the end of the day, going back to what you were saying, Diane, the essence of who I am was a little black girl from Selma. And no matter where I went in life, I was proud to be from Selma. And everybody knew I was from Selma. Um, and so when I decided to run for Congress, um, the hardest part was trying to get name recognition in America. And I remember calling every Princetonian I could find and asking them for money. And my, uh, one of my freshman year roommates reminded me of a funny story. Uh, when I was running for freshman class president at Princeton, uh, my, my, much to my mom's chagrin and mine now, my slogan was Mouth of the South. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am, right. flash forward 25 years, and I'm, I'm now running for Congress. Um, and at any rate, which, so my roommate reminded me of the time I was passing out literature at one of the um, dining halls. And I was passing out literature and introducing myself, and so I introduced this gentleman, uh, and he stopped me in my tracks, and he goes, well, let me introduce myself. I'm Pierre DuPont. I said, oh, very nice to meet you. Terry Sewell, running for Congress. I mean, running for freshman class president. Sorry. Mouth of the South, please vote for me. He goes, no, 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 Pierre DuPont. And I kind of stopped, and I was like, OK. And what he was talking about was that he was a DuPont of Delaware, you know, whose parents and forefathers had lots of buildings named after them in Princeton. Um, and I remember stopping dead in my tracks and saying, well, you know, Pierre, I didn't formally introduce myself. I'm Terry Sewell. You know, the Sewells of Selma. <laughs> and flash forward 25 years, and I'm running for Congress, and I need to raise a whole bunch of money. I remember calling Pierre DuPont, uh, and finally, after much rigmarole, got in touch with him. And his secretary said, Terry Sewell from, Terry Sewell, um, from Princeton is on the line. And he grabbed the phone, and he said, is this Terry Sewell from Selma? And I said, yes, it is. And he says, I understand that Terry Sewell from Selma wants to represent Selma. And I said, I do. And he goes, what's the maximum I can give you? <laughs> Isn't that great? Aww. So being, being proud of who you are and where you come from, I can give you lots of stories about how that makes a difference. But I also know that the Selma that I grew up in was vastly different than the Selma my dad grew up in. My dad grew up in Selma, Alabama in the 40s. And he grew up in a segregated public school system. I grew up in Selma in the 80s. And I grew up in a integrated public school system. And, you know, dad, I can't even imagine my dad, who's six foot seven, you know, going to um, water fountains that said colored only. I mean, in the very town that I grew up in. Very different. I was nurtured by the folks in my town. Yes, my parents were educators, um, you know, but I, can tell you that everyone from my Sunday school teacher to my um, debate coach to black and white st uh, teachers really nurtured me and told me I could be somebody and I, I believed them. And it was really that nurturing which and that sense of community that really made me think that I could come back home and when I came back home run for an open seat, uh, the only democratic seat in, in the state of Alabama and win. And I can tell you that I never thought about being a woman. I thought about being, that I was the 7th Congressional District. 
I represented the very best that that district had to offer, but I also shared its frustrations. I knew that the next wave of empowerment had to be economic empowerment. My district is the poorest district in the state of Alabama. The median income for a family of four, $32,000. But here's what I know for sure, that what we lack in the seventh district of Alabama, which by the way, is the civil rights district. It includes Selma, Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Montgomery, all of those great cities are in my district. And I knew that what we lacked in economic prosperity, we more than made up for in heart, a strong work ethic, in a, in a fighting spirit, and that what the people of my district needed were better resources and opportunities. And who better to fight and advocate on behalf of that district than someone who took from that district, felt nurtured by that district, and knew what, what was possible with a little bit of resources and a whole bunch of opportunities. I was living it. And that really was my motivation for running for Congress. I can tell you that I probably ran at the wrong time <laughs> since the acrimony that is Congress is real. The partisan bickering is real. The lack of uh, earmarks, directed spending, if you will. When you have a poor district, it is about investing, investing in better infrastructure and roads and bridges so that I can bring better industry. Investing, investing in little children, their education, so that they can come up and truly go not only to college, but decide that they want to do skills and, 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 have, and close that skills gap that really exists in my district. So, and all that requires money. I mean, there's just no way around it. It requires money. And so, this is a very difficult time for me to be in Congress. But I'm in Congress, uh, in the 114th Congress, this is my third term. Uh, I was elected in 2010 during the big Republican wave. Uh, in fact, I was president of the freshman class, and we were a class of Democrats of nine. <laughs> nine. 87 of them and nine of us. Very, very interesting time to come into Congress. Um, but I'm not deterred, because I, the people I represent have waited too long for representation that will address rural parts of my district. Birmingham is the shining city in our district, and it has needs that are very much akin to urban areas in the UK, in, in America. But Selma, while it's widely known, it's really a town of 19,000 people. And we welcomed 100,000, would you say, Dr. Jennings, to Selma over this past weekend to commemorate <coughs> the 50th anniversary. And I am proudest of the fact that we had a bipartisan delegation of 100 members of Congress who came with us. And I didn't see my role as preaching to them because there's clearly a renewed assault on voting rights going on in America. I saw it as an opportunity to teach, not preach, but teach. Um, there's no way that you can walk in the footsteps of John Lewis with John Lewis and not be transformed. My hope is that all of America, all the world, will who witness what happened in Selma, will come away from that with a renewed recommitment and dedication to the ideals that those marchers march for, for equality and justice for all. And we in Congress just passed a gold medal bill. I, I was the, the key sponsor of this gold medal bill to give to the foot soldiers of the movement in Selma a congressional gold medal, which is the highest civilian honor that one can bestow upon, that Congress can bestow upon any, any person. And it passed unanimously out of both houses. My Alabama delegation of all Republicans co-sponsored it with me. My two Republican senators uh, led the charge uh, for that bill to pass out of the Senate. Um, and I am proud to say that the President signed it into law uh, on Air Force One on that Saturday before he landed in Selma. And while, <laughs> while it's a long time coming for the foot soldiers of the movement to get their proper due, so many people know the story of John Lewis, but there are so many unknown, unsung heroes and sheroes. Uh, for example, my State of the Union guest this past year was Amelia Boynton. She, at 103 years old, was featured in the movie Selma. I don't know if, you, if you've seen the movie Selma. Amelia Boynton, when you were talking, Diane, I was thinking about what she said in the movie. Amelia Boynton was the one with the cat-eyed glasses who was walking with Coretta Scott King when Coretta was nervous about meeting with Malcolm X and felt like she was not prepared. Do you remember that scene? And she said to Coretta, you are prepared. You are the descendant of kings and queens. 
you remember that part? Um, the blood that flows through your veins survives slave ships. You are prepared. Well, she was my guest. She's now 103 years old. And um, as I was waiting in the holding room to introduce her to the president before his speech, lots of cabinet secretaries were passed by, and everyone said the same thing. Miss Boynton, we stand on your shoulders. Miss Boynton, we stand on your shoulders. And Miss Boynton was like, get off my shoulders. There's plenty of work to do. Do your own work. Do your own work. And I just want to sit down by saying, we have so much work to do. Yes, there are now 104 women in Congress out of 535. So the 114th Congress has 104 women senators and women members of the House. But that's still 20%, right? Yet women make up 50, over 50% of those college graduates every year that are coming in America. We are so where, so we're so, we're not anywhere near where we should be when it comes to proper um, representation proportional representation. Um, and there's lots of work to do. Um, when I think about the fact that in America, we're still struggling over the whole immigrant issue and comprehensive immigration reform is necessary, you know, and that my brown brothers and sisters are, are experiencing the same thing that blacks did 50 years ago. Um, and that even in America today, there are these racist incidents that, that still happen. University of Oklahoma and that fraternity just happened this past weekend, the weekend that we were commemorating the 50th anniversary of Selma. So there's lots and lots of work that we all can be doing. Um, I just want to close by saying I stand on the shoulders not only of Amelia <coughs> Boynton, but of Diane Abbott. I watched you, Diane, become the first um, black woman in Britain to be a member of parliament. And I know that the journey that I now take was only made possible because of wonderful women such as yourself who took the bold step to see in the mirror not just their imperfections. We as women often look in the mirror and we see a pimple, the wrinkles. Men look in the mirror and they see the president, the governor, <laughs> the mayor. But you, you put a mirror up to all women around the world and you continue to do that through your hard fight every day on the House of Commons. And I just want to say it was an honor not only to study you as a student, but to become your friend and now to be a, a fellow policymaker. It is amazing um, that we can come full circle. So this is a very, very much a full circle moment for me, and I just want to say thank you.